Well, welcome back to another episode of Red Tinted Glasses. Five games without a win, four defeats, and I'm being joined today by Lewis Walker to hopefully provide a bit of reason to the current slump in form that Aberdeen are experiencing. Lewis, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me again. I'll try anyway. I'll do my best. Yeah, because you mean certainly there is a few criticisms appearing on social media and you heard the disgruntlement at half time and full time during the game yesterday. Could you understand why there was frustration from the crowd at the the one one draw yesterday? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, when you look at it just on paper, us v Ross County at home, we should absolutely be winning that every week. Um, I think we all wanted that, you know, that bounce back from the European um, disappointment. Um, disappointment. So, yeah, to not get a win and you, you know to be behind for so long as well it was very close to being a defeat, which would have been, I mean, a disaster really to get beat at home to them. Um, so, yeah, hundred percent, totally understand it. But at the same time, I know you know it's uh, no wins in five, but then before that it was four wins in a row, and you know we're unbeaten, we're two points off top. So mm. it isn't. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, football, foot, foot, yeah, yeah, being the operative word, but it just shows how funny a game football really can be and how quickly, um, you know, I think someone commented on the YouTube um, channel um, after the, the Carabag game saying, you know, the honeymoon period is maybe coming to an end for Stephen Glass and how important Sunday was. And I think if the honeymoon period hadn't finished, it certainly has based on that result and we really need to see a reaction um, after the international break. And I think for me, this is the problem with Aberdeen, you get confident that we're doing well and we'll see a reaction. And just when you gain a bit of confidence in that Aberdeen team, they always just know how to let you back down because Hearts and Hibs have continued to set the pace at the top of the league. And yeah, I mean, pre-match Sunday, I was fairly confident that we were going to continue to to keep pace with Edinburgh too. Yeah, hundred percent. The bubble sort of burst in it, um, but it is, I mean, it does change so quickly. You have to you have to remember that, and I think just with the whole, the whole new regime, um, it's, it's it's so different now without McInnes and Glassin and Russellin and um, Appaloos. Like, I don't think we can overestimate how different that'll be for the squad and the the training methods and everything. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Hibs and Hearts have got the continue continuation of. Jack Cross and Robbie Nielsen have been there a little while now um, and we've had a, like, a, an overhaul on the bench and in the squad so it will take time um, it is a bump in the road not beating Ross County I think Glass would have expected to win Cormac would have expected a victory as well all the sports obviously did it too so um, I suppose we, you just have to have patience I'm just saying before we recorded let be so many of us want to make this out um, for so long um, some longer than others but um so to get that change, we need to just be patient now and remember that, yeah, we could have had eight years and although he's did a good job and things, it's not going to be plain sailing straight away for class. Um, so I think the international break has come at a really good time um, with, you know, that change in the style of play and things, getting getting everyone onto the training pitch for longer. I think um, class said after the game, they've barely trained, or barely done anything, you know, substantial on the training pitch since the start of the European games, which is what, over a month now yeah. um, since pre-season so yeah it's, it's definitely come the right time yeah definitely and I suppose you know Cormac and Wicks had built this game up as being the homecoming not the homecoming we'd hoped for anyway into on the pitch but off the pitch you know it's great to see so many fans turning up and many kids coming along for their, their first time at Pataudry and hopefully despite the result they might be encouraged to come back again yeah, well, you do like to hope so. I feel like that always happens with Aberdeen. You get some sort of event or something, and then it's a drab affair on the pitch, and no one will come come again. Um, but it's yeah, it's, of course, it's great to get uh, more fans in and a bit of a atmosphere for the kids, and you know, the the free whatever you call those things, plastic yeah, bag free, things, yeah. plastic inflatable things, which weren't actually used that much. But um, it's good. Yeah, it's anything to encourage little kids along is is good. Hopefully, they weren't put off too much by the the cold and the performance um, or the singing beforehand I, I didn't see it to be fair I came in a bit late but um, yeah I mean I mean obviously Iona Fife doing the rendition of Northern Lights for the, the promo it was it is a lovely version for that sort of thing but for me 
when you're trying to get a crowd hyped before the game, it just did, didn't hit the right note for me. Um, you know, you've got the fans trying in the red shed trying to sing along, but they're about four or five words ahead of her because they're <laughs> singing at the pace of the football song compared to to her version. So it's probably a sign of things to come when that those two didn't intertwine. But I tell you, certainly when it comes to winter, if they could keep those fire heaters on during the game, because what a heat coming into the market <laughs> and off of them. Yeah, That's super, yeah. Very toasty. So uh, yeah, <laughs> hope they, they're a welcome addition in, in the winter month. It's, you get a lot of uh, every stand of the game for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, on the pitch, though, we did see debuts for Matty Longstaff and Austin Samuels with um, Marley Watkins, who had rejoined the side and um, just fit enough for the bench. Were you surprised to see both um, handed starts and, and how impressed were you with their debuts? Um, I wasn't overly surprised. I think I expected at least one of them to come in just for that bit of you know, something different, something to get the fans excited about, um, spruce up the team sort of thing. So um, it was good to see, especially Longstaff start. Um, I think he did all right. Um, I, I suppose you can't expect too much when they've been in the door two minutes, but um, mm-hmm. he's clearly a decent player and he's got a good background. So I'm sure he'll do well for us. Samuels, was, he was lively, um, a bit raw, I think. Um, but, you know, he offers something that we, we need, we, like, we need pace. And I think he did offer that. He's quite direct, which is good. Um, sh- could and should have done better in a few moments but it was certainly good to get them on the pitch early now with yeah, again international break or hopefully getting more accustomed to how we play and what we can do Yeah I think you definitely saw in the, the opening two minutes when we played the long ball over the top um, for Austin Samuels to chase just how much pace he's going to bring to this side um, bit of trickery bit of skill that we've obviously missed with Ryan Hedges out of the side recently um, but I, I totally agree I think he is still a bit raw um, he seemed to want to batter the ball across the face of goal at 100 mile an hour instead of you know picking out the teammates and I think it, it kind of goes back to what you said about Stephen Glassing you know we've not had much time to work on the training ground because it it was quite evident that both him and Matty Longstaff obviously haven't spent a lot of time with their teammates because, you know, there was one instance in the first half that I think Samuels drilled it in front of the six yard box. Nobody got the end of, but Ramirez just held his run on the penalty spot and was just looking saying, well, this is where I wanted it. But I was watching Samuels and Samuels pointed to the six yard box. So there was just that little bit of miscommunication that obviously is going to come when players haven't spent that time with each other I think you know you said it last time you know when you came on the podcast in the game against Hearts it's important for the players to continue playing together because they'll gel and they'll learn how each other each other plays but certainly encouraging debuts from both and, and, and you know for me I thought Marley Watkins also was was fine off the bench and what he brought when we were chasing the game yeah I thought Watkins was yeah he was okay I thought he was a bit sluggish to be honest but that's understandable given he's I doubt he's played much um, just on that point with Ramirez, I mean, that happened quite a few times where the ball was like flashed across, either, either flashed across or cut back, and Ramirez was the opposite every time. <laughs> really frustrating. And it's hard to, like, I, I think Ramirez is quite like Rooney in the way he's, you know, just quite a bit of a poacher, number nine. Mm. And usually, I mean, you want to, I'm contradicting myself, but he's in the right place at the right time, usually. But this time it was just like, you know, it just needed a fault, him to fall once. Mm. Or and it could have it could have been like four or five occasions. It could have been on the end of one. So hopefully that is just a case of getting to know your teammates better, rather than a case of he's making the wrong run or he's not running. You know, yeah. I think there is potential there that he could have scored two or three on another day. But hopefully he does. And mm. um, once you know there was a time Ojo in the first half was loads. In the, yeah, honestly, about five times it felt like he could have been on the end of a, a, a cross or a cutback and. It just wasn't, but hopefully that's just one of those days. And yeah. his good days. Yeah, and I think for me, the longer that game went on, especially at one 0 it did feel like it's going to be one of those those days. Yeah. Um, on the signing front, though, we weren't finished before um, before the game. Uh, well, Cormac actually decided to break the news himself late on Saturday night that that David Bates had signed a three year deal. Uh, the club officially announcing that on on Sunday morning. I think. We'll, we'll get into it, but again, yesterday highlighting the importance of David Bates signing and, and hopefully he will bring a bit of stability to our defence uh, when domestic duty returns against Motherwell. Yeah, not like Dave to um, enjoy the Twitter attention. Is it? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, no, hopefully, but it's, I, I mean, I'm not going to pretend to have seen him much over the last few years while he's been away, but um, I think more on the evidence of how McCrory's been playing, um, it'll be good to hope that hopefully he comes in and slots in quite seamlessly with Gallagher and obviously Conte's injury as well. It's imperative that they got off to a good start and form a partnership. And I suppose it depends on um, if we'll see Ferguson go away or not. I'm inclined to think he probably will. And that'll probably see McCrory move into centre mid, maybe, um, if he if he continues to start at all. Um, and hopefully, yeah, Bale is, um, Bates, sorry, is hopefully the perfect foil to come straight into centre back and give us a bit of solidity, which we, yeah, we definitely need. Yeah, definitely. And um, obviously, we've got hope that Gallagher comes through international duty. Uh, injury free I'm not sure if he'll actually play for Scotland in these games maybe the Moldova one um, thinking ahead but yeah, we'd like to see him come back safe because we definitely if we're not going to sign anybody between now and tomorrow evening if we're recording this the day before the transfer window closes um, yeah we, we need all the centre backs that we can get because I think playing midfielders in there has not really been working for us this season yeah 100% <laughs> but, but you know the game started with obviously expectation from the stands and, and we started brightly touched on there Austin Samuels getting in behind and, and forced an early corner which I thought Declan Gallagher was really unlucky from kind of volleyed it and it seemed to be the story of our half where a Ross County player was just in front of the box and we just had nobody following up the, the rebound from that. Yeah, we did start right late and, you know, it's, it's one of those games where you expect us to have all the ball and we did and, you know, create half chances here and there and it, you, you just you just want the ball to fall somewhere, like, you know, get a bit of luck somewhere and mm. someone will go in and it just wasn't happening for us um, for, well, almost the entire game. So that was frustrating. But, um, I think that's was just something we're missing that extra something creativity invention in like in middle of the park especially and um, just to you know get get the breakthrough yeah and you know what we saw from Samuels down the left um through the first half well, so we didn't really have an out and out winger on the right hand side Funzo Ojo's kind of de- being developed into a right wing winger but I think when you see what Samuels is offering on one side we've got the creativity of Ramsey more predominant I think on the right it's quite exciting what we could have as a threat when Hedges is back in fit coming down that right yeah Hedges is is the main man we're missing definitely he's got something that no one else does in our team I think that's just that extra spark I think Ojo's I like Ojo and he's been you know really good in his what he's been asked to do but at the end of the day he's not a he's not a winger at our level you know he's, Mm. he's not a to finish at the top, the top two, three places in the in the Premiership, I don't think he's he's at that level. So um, yeah, if Hedges can come in with Ramsey's absolutely brilliant behind him, um, Ramsey's almost like our only threat at the moment, which is <laughs> slightly worrying. I mean, it's obviously great because he's brilliant, but he need more than that. And Samuels, yeah, uh, remains to be seen whether that he'll be a regular starter there um, on the left or not. But yeah, he certainly offers a bit of pace. It was interesting. I thought in the first. Well, first off, especially, I thought we were more inclined to play long over the top mm. for, um, for signings, which isn't something we've done much. Um, obviously, we try and keep it on the deck quite a lot, but I suppose it's good to have that extra option. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good point. That was kind of surprised me as well, because I thought we would maybe, you know, try and pass Ross County off the park, create spaces for players to get in behind and 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 find like kind of maybe like what Hibbs did because when I was speaking to Andy Skinner for the, the preview he said like Hibbs just kind of blew Ross County out of the water early on and yeah. once they scored the floodgates open but we didn't really kind of well when we created chances it didn't go the right way oh Joey like you touched on there flashing the ball across and then obviously Austin Samuels himself having a header from probably four or five yards out I mean the offside it wasn't given officially as offside because the referee played play on but um, he'll be really disappointed that the flag wasn't gone up to deny him a celebration instead of just heading straight to the keeper. Yeah, he should have, well, yeah, if he was offside, it wasn't a matter, but he should have done better. I just thought we were so, so like one dimension on the way we played mm-hmm. and also the, the team itself, you know, the, the players out there, the three, Longstaff, Brown and um, Ferguson, just all very, quite similar, really. Yeah. 
and they're all sort of doing the same thing. So obviously Brown comes deeper to get the ball, but then it was passed through the first and the long staff. And then from there, there was no, you know, like nothing coming in between the lines. It was sort of just a, a block of 4-3-3 as opposed to anyone coming in between and intertwining or anything like that. So it's, and that makes it so much easier for the Ross County defence. Obviously they, they played well Ross County mm. but, and they kept to the shape well, but it's so much easier to keep to a shape when the other team are so, like, so flat and uninventive, which I thought we were. Yeah, I think we were, yeah, it's a good point you make. We were really predictable throughout that first half and for large spells of the second half as well. If we couldn't get it down the left-hand side, you know, what I was saying to you before recording, which is why I had a lot of frustration yesterday, it was, okay, we're not getting down that side, pass it back, go to Dean Campbell, pass it to Gallagher, go out wide, try with Ramsey. Oh, not working, go back. And it was like, every time yeah. it didn't work down one side, it had to go back to either McCrory or Gallagher to start again. And I think a lot of people have picked up on that three in midfield. They were all so similar. It was almost like we were shoehorning them all in for the sake of shoehorning them in. Um, and to be honest, yeah. you know, whether or not he's going to stay or not, I was surprised to see Lewis Ferguson in that starting 11. Um, for me, I think I I viewed it as an indication that he is likely to stay, although I'm sure the club's resolve will be tested over the next 24 hours or so. Um, obviously, yeah. like I said, we're recording this on, on Monday night, but what did you make of Scott Brown's performance in particular in that first half? Because I actually thought for as well as he's performed this season, he looked a little bit off the pace and a bit sluggish and, and sloppy at times as well. Yeah, I don't think he had his best game, really. Um, I suppose it's one of those games you don't, you don't really need Scott Brown in, like Ross County at home when mm. when you've got, you know, the the like the centre fields that we've already got. Um, like, he's, he's not it's not imperative for him to start. But, like, at the same time, he's obviously a quality player, so... Um, if he's fit, he's going to start. Let's be honest. I think every game. Um, but yeah, you know, he didn't have the best, the best of starts, um, best of games. There was, I think, there was a time he lost possession a couple of times in the middle. Actually, didn't, which he almost scored from. Yeah. Um, so I mean, he'll know himself. It wasn't good enough, really. Yeah, and obviously you said they lost the possession, which, which released Ross County for um, their early chance. But Joe Lewis coming out well to smother from Ross Callahan, and you know, Joe Lewis has had his critics in in recent weeks um, you know maybe his performances haven't been of a standard that many of us have come to expect but I think you know yesterday showed just what a top keeper Joe Lewis really was because he pulled off some really good saves to keep us well in the game uh, first and second half Yeah I thought he was really good and after that save I remember saying to my mate who I was at a game with like when everyone attacker goes through, I never expect them to score one on one. Like I always back Joe Lewis, yeah. which is, I mean, that's saying something when you've got, when your striker's through one on one, you expect a goal really. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, for me, Joe Lewis, is, he comes out so big and makes some brilliant saves that we just take for granted now. I think a lot of other keepers wouldn't, wouldn't do anywhere near as well as he does. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's funny, I said the exact same to my friend Keith as well at the game because it's the way he comes out and he just makes himself, I mean, he's a, he's a tall lad, but he, he spreads himself really well uh, and, you know, his lanky legs often are the one that blocks yeah. a shot, but, you know, he's obviously worked on that and it, it has saved us on, on countless occasions. But unfortunately, you know, as seems to be a custom with Stephen Glass's Aberdeen sides, we concede once again. Some question marks around the goal from an offside point of view. Some people raised question marks if Blair Spittle was on or off when he delivered the ball. I think Ross McCrory certainly thought he was because his hand was in the air when the ball was coming in. And I think, you know, we discussed this before we recorded, it was a bit sloppy from Ross McCrory once again in, in terms of dealing with that ball that, that ultimately led to us going 1-0 down. Yeah, he just just wasn't strong enough really he got a he sort of just swung a leg and was trickled to the county attacker he should really just, uh, just be getting straight through and just be bigger and stronger and take everything with it but um, yeah it might be an offside it was hard to tell the replays wasn't it mm. I think um, he makes one of those runs that sort of makes it look like he might be offside but yeah we couldn't you can't see the whole the whole Aberdeen backline to tell um, but it, yeah it should have been dealt with by McCrory he's just he's just not looked like a centre half this season yeah, and I mean, like you say, either you either put your foot through because he seemed to obviously goes with his right foot to clear it, but you kind of, and again, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Do you not just go with your left and just boot it out for a corner, regroup, and 
try and deal with that. It's just one of those things. But, you know, County had, in fairness to them, you know, we, we, we've said, you know, they played well throughout yesterday, but that period of pressure, they, you know, they had us under because it wasn't just a one-off attack. They'd had some sustained attacks, corners that I remember Joe Lewis had to actually tip one of the corners over the bar from just underneath the crossbar. And it kind of made me think that for all the possession and chances we created, we weren't taking them. County came up with odd one or two and took it. And obviously then, you know, we, we faced an uphill, uphill task, but Regan Charles Cook finishes it really well. Probably going the side you don't expect him to, but again, it's almost laughable because Ross McCrory is standing right in front of Joe Lewis when he's hitting the ball. So Joe Lewis is probably not even going to have a chance to see it until it's it's too late because it is up the other side. Yeah, it was it was a good finish by the boy. Um, to be fair to him, it was it's funny games like this. You always think back like, oh, we could, it could have been four or five, could have easily won. But then, as you say, at the same time, they actually had chances themselves. They could have easily scored another couple. Um, yeah. So maybe uh, to be fair, maybe got off with the draw in the end. Um, but. I suppose it's just going to be something we get used to, I suppose, is conceding chances to the other team when if we're playing more openly than we used to. Obviously, we're playing. It's one thing being open, but when we've got the defence, like a makeshift defence, as we do now, mm-hmm. uh, it probably gets to a point where you sort of settle down and <laughs> you know try and be a bit more closed and less less risky. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, yeah, with Bates and McKenzie return on hopefully get better yeah and I suppose that, that was the other the other big sort of team news was that McKenzie was either being rested or I'm not sure if there was a, a problem with him that he didn't play obviously Dean Campbell coming in at left back but overall I, I thought Dean Campbell had a pretty solid game there was you know no problems down it wasn't like we were being exploited down the left back area he wasn't outstanding but then again no one in red really was you know, grabbing the headlines, maybe you know, folk will say Calvin Ramsey, but he seems to do that every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought Campbell was fine. He'd, yeah, like you say, he did his job. He did what he needs to do. Um, and I can only assume McKenzie's. It can't be a major issue if he's considering he's on the bench. Mm. Um, yeah, so for that is nothing. And yeah, Ramsey. Yeah, just brilliant. I was actually checked before the, this um, when his contract for so 2024, which is. A good few years, but hopefully they're looking at even improving that and get some sort of clauses in there because mm-hmm. we see Nathan Patterson, I think, eight million today to yeah. Everton. So, I mean, there's no reason Ramsey couldn't be in the Scotland squad soon. The way he's mm-hmm. playing and our lack of right backs for Scotland, he's he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and the thing is as well, he's also playing more regularly than Nathan Patterson as well. Yeah. So, um, there's no reason why. And I said that yesterday as well. Scouts will start picking up on his performances. You know, the fact how it was, I read somewhere about the amount of chances he created he created more chances like three times more than any other Aberdeen player yesterday yeah <laughs> it says all the stats say it all but you know for as well as we attacked and pressed it's got to be said how well and how resolutely Ross County defended that 1-0 lead because for large parts it was bodies on the line but the guy that they've got on loan from Arsenal um, Clark, he really stood out for me because I thought he did well dealing with Austin Samuels um, for large parts in that first half. Yes, he got beaten a couple of times, but you know, still stuck at his task. Yeah, yeah, they did defend well. They kept good shape to them, and you know, won most balls and did well, which frustratingly, I see they've, they've signed quite a lot of English boys alone. Um, mm-hmm. They used that market quite well. Probably Malky's um, contacts down south. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah I mean given given their form and lack of wins I, I really expected us to win pretty comfortably but I suppose they're going through similar to us and a new manager and a new style of play and things like that it might take time for, for them to get better if they do I suppose time will tell if they're a decent team or not but they certainly did pretty well against us yeah definitely and you know well, we've all seen what Ross Callahan can do at his time at Hamilton and I thought yesterday again he pretty much ran the show for Ross County in midfield and and caused us plenty of problems and had it not been for Calvin Ramsey on the goal line he could have well doubled up Ross County's lead yeah yeah he's done well for, like fair play to Callahan because I think he was quite derided at heart so he came through mm. um, I just don't think he had the quality but he's yeah he's I mean made a he had a decent um, career for himself the last few years of the Premiership with Hamilton and now Ross County. So um, he played well and 
yeah, you could have scored there. It was a great block, maybe slightly fortuitous, I'm not sure, um, from Ramsey, but he did really to get back and that, yeah, very easily could have been 2-0 or, and, yeah, game over. But, so Yeah, and I suppose the, the other chance that they had as well for, for 2-0 came from Regan Charles Cook again. You know, Samuels lost the ball in midfield. There was a few cries for it being a foul, but... I think it would have been a very soft foul, but certainly as a home fan, you'd have been appealing for it anyway. But County broke on as well. And when Regan Charles Cook's played in in plenty of space, you expect him to kind of hammer it at Joe Lewis. But I said at the time, it felt like he was just passing it into Joe Lewis's hand. A real missed opportunity um, for what could have been for Ross County. Yeah, that was yeah such a good chance and such a feeble effort. It was laughable, actually. I remember turning to me and saying how bad that was. I suppose that's the difference in quality between you know the bottom of the league and the mm. top. You're expecting one of our players to you know at least make the keeper work as opposed to just you know, fluff it into his hands. Um, but again, that's I suppose when you're chasing the game and you're playing openly and expansively, you're going to get caught on the counter every so often. I suppose we're just lucky they didn't they didn't uh, make the most of the chances they created. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, in the second half, we we, we continued to pile on the play, pressure. You know, this was the first time in a long time that I can remember Stephen Glass not actually changing things at half time. So he was obviously confident that the starting 11 could continue to do something and, and break down Ross County's defences. But it wasn't for a want of trying. Um, Funzo Ojo somehow not getting onto a ball flashed across the the face a goal and Ramirez I think it more hits his back leg instead of his front leg it just really had the sense as the game wore on it was going to be one of those days yeah 100% one of those days is right everyone you know everyone in the crowd saying the same thing getting so frustrated by these chances it's just when it's you know you're from I was in the Y so further away from the goal and you know you see all those balls going across all the like Surely just a tap in. How is this not going in? Mm. <laughs> and it just seems to happen over and over. Um, so frustrating. But some, I mean, sometimes you do just get one of those days, don't you? And something doesn't fall for you. As you say, it wasn't for a for a lack of trying or anything. Um, it just didn't come until until later on when the I thought when Jet came on, I thought he made a difference. You might have come on to that yourself. But. Yeah, it did. But I just want to go back to kind of the the creating of the chances. What did you make of our set pieces in the second half? You know, we've all seen how well Calvin Ramsey can deliver a ball. But these floated corners that we seem to just continue with in the second half got really frustrating because we seemed to struggle to beat the first man with a, with a lot of them. We didn't seem to decide to vary them at all. I've seen, yeah, I've seen a few disgruntlement about the corners. I actually didn't think they were that bad. I think it's one of those, again, I mentioned last week about sort of just trusting the coaches and what they do in the training pitch because mm. funnily enough they know more than more than you and I but because yeah. obviously that's one of Alan Russell's specialities isn't it they've all set pieces and Harry Kane getting the golden boot because of him and things like that so like those floating crosses they can look bad if if you know if, if they're slightly out or nobody gets on the end of them but all it takes is a well-timed run um and you know you get a, a clear head for goal so I, I didn't think it was that bad to be honest so there was a couple of chances he played one um, you know to the to the edge of the box and I can't remember who it was had a decent shot which was blocked it was the uh, Ramirez one it was similar to what we did which obviously paid off yeah. against Riedel but like um, uh, it didn't uh, annoyingly he then did it with Hayes <laughs> which is obviously on his weaker foot and you think for fuck's sake so yeah I mean sometimes it'd be good to uh, switch up I suppose on the training pitch, they'll think of a number of routines, and then it, I suppose up to the players on the pitch when to use what, and maybe maybe that's where something different could have happened. And it was around just a young guy. If someone else can take charge of, you know, what what exactly to do. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think it's it's always it's very. I think it's an easy criticism to make, isn't it? Like the corners right. But, <laughs> it was just something that I picked up on at the game, and just wanted to to hear a, a different opinion from yeah. it um, because yeah it just seemed to be that it was just constantly the same and you know mm. we, we saw it to affect the floated ball into the back post in the opening game against Hack and how effective that was and the corner routines have worked it just seemed to be and like you said it maybe just takes it not to be hit right it was like two or three just was always not getting even reaching the front post Yeah. and when you're 1-0 down chasing a game 
probably and like like I said, I was expecting us to win that game comfortably. It, it gets frustrated and it gets picked up on. But you made the point there about Jet coming on and having an impact. And I totally agree. I actually think he did have a big impact once we then brought Johnny Hayes on and moved Jet into the middle of the park because Jet initially came on and seemed to play as a winger. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, again, he looked a bit... He was obviously you know creating chances and linking up with Ramsey, but... I just thought for someone so tall when Ross County were struggling with balls into the box, why have we got our tallest player standing on the right wing? And then at some point taking the throw-ins from the main stand side trying yeah. to get a long throw. Just didn't didn't make sense. Just a long throw with a zero zero runoff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, mean, I could ever do. But um, no, I agree. He was more effective centrally. He's he is something different in that he can get the ball down, but also carry with the ball and like go past a man, even though he's He's like really slow, but then at the same time, not that slow, if you know what I mean. Like, like the way he glides over the pitch, it seems to like cover up for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he like, provides that little bit different. Um, yeah, like he can carry it and go past the man and then link up with, with Ramirez mm. and the attackers. Um, so I agree, yeah, better in the central central areas and yeah, something to hit and make something out of. Yeah, and you know, we saw some brilliant defending from Calvin Ramsey. We saw some equally brilliant defending from Ross County. Um, I don't know who it was. It wasn't shown on the highlights and I couldn't see from the Merklin, but they, you know, the clearance on the line from Lewis Ferguson's um, header, but their resilience was finally broken when Jet was very influential in the break. I didn't think he was going to spot Johnny Hayes, but he played in Johnny Hayes. Very tame effort in, in my respect from Johnny, but the keeper couldn't handle it and that's what you want from a poacher of a striker Christian Ramirez following in and bundling the ball into the back of the net to ultimately earn us that point yeah 100% it was it was good play by Jay he took it down and played a really good ball to his and yeah you're right it wasn't it wasn't the best of efforts and the laid lot should have easily held that I don't think he's much of a keeper to be honest he's like he played well until then but um, he's certainly a bottom half um, premiership keeper at the most um, and he, yeah he should have held that but it was really good by Ramirez following up I did mention before recording I think when I was watching the highlights it looks like Ramirez is actually offside mm-hmm. um, I've not seen anyone else mention that so which is fine, <laughs> but um, it certainly looks like it if you if you pause on his shoots. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, I think we go off with one slightly there, but it is really good of him to get there first. And that's I suppose that is parallels to really you know that just yeah. the pokes are getting there and following up on on mistakes like that, which is great. And yeah, he'll be chuffed as well because yeah, obviously last few games he's been at a kick just the way he p- plays and that he's you know just predominantly in the six yard box. Mm-hmm. He's not that much um, involved in the build-up play. So if he doesn't get the chances, then he's essentially like non-existent, it looks yeah. like. So for his confidence in the, the teams and the fans' confidence, it's good that he got near that. Yeah, and I think the, the fans' confidence, obviously, you know, I think it would have been a totally different outlook on this podcast had we been talking about a 1-0 defeat compared to a 1-1 draw. You know, ultimately, we're still undefeated in, in the league, sitting fourth. Um, as we head into the international break you know you said we got off with one in terms of maybe Ramirez being on or offside but we've also got off with yet another uh, you know point on the board thanks to another goalkeeping howler you know we got gifted two at Livingston and we've got gifted one again at Tawdry I don't know which way you want to look at is it is it luck or is it just you know the continued determination and drive of this squad not to settle for anything until the full-time whistle that, that's kind of ultimately earned these extra points for us. Yeah, I think you have to try and look at the positives in that it is because we're putting on sustained pressure for much of the game against these teams. Um, I think I mentioned last time, it, it does feel like there's a confidence in the squad that we will score. Mm. Um, it's not like we're, you know, we don't look out of ideas, I don't think. Like we, I think it's just going to take a while to sort of get up to speed of how we want to play and create chances and especially with some of our more influential players like Hedges out um, I think we just take the positives from the Hufflers if we can do that and hope there's more to come <laughs> Yeah um, definitely and I mean obviously you know we'd have liked to have been three wins from uh, well three wins from four is it going into this international break but 
it, it's not to be. And I suppose you've got to, like you said, take the positives, the fact that we're still unbeaten. We're, we're going to carry, hopefully, some momentum into a tricky away tie, I think, uh, at Motherwell. But, you know, you mentioned it at the start, just how important is this international break now? Is it coming at the right time for Aberdeen? Yeah, no, I think it definitely is. It is really important. Um, and comes comes out a good time after the disappointment in the last couple of weeks. It's going to be, yeah, just uh, brilliant for Glass and uh, Glass and Russell and the team to to get all the new boys together, especially with you know Bates and Longstaff and Sam was just in the door, and mm-hmm. to get that time together. I don't suspect there's many away in international like Ramsey's and Ramsey and uh, Gallagher. And McGinn. Dean Campbell and McGinn, yeah. So there'll, there'll be a few of them away, but um, the majority of the squad will be all together and mm-hmm. with the uh, swanky trading trading complex, whatever you want to call it, Corrin Park. Mm-hmm. And yeah, hopefully that hopefully that pays off. And we see I think we've got some other well, St. Johnson and some other Diddy team at the end of the month, just the three games. So like three like we'll go into favourites for all of them. Mm-hmm. Hopefully. If you come out of that on nine points in a short month, then you you know everyone will be buzzing again. Yeah, especially because you're then playing Celtic on this Sunday, the first Sunday in October, so before the next international break it is. So you'd be looking to to go into that Celtic game with nine points. I, I totally agree because you then, <clears throat> I always feel like anything you take from those games is a bonus, but home games were still unbeaten. Uh, well, domestically unbeaten at home this season. So you want to, to carry that form hopefully into, into that game. Whether or not there's going to be away fans um, in for that game, I, I kind of took from Cormac's tweet that there won't be, um, whilst there's the the red zone around the the dugout. Yeah. So that that could be an interesting match up. You know, facing Celtic with just home fans, how how will that that affect the game remains to be seen. But you know, you spoke about there the, the time that the players that have come in will have to gel during this break. Stephen Glass saying in his post-match interview that you know all the ins are done. Would you have liked to see maybe another centre back coming in, or are we just going to be trusting that Devlin might miraculously be fit sometime soon to to provide cover there? But he said, you know, there may be still going to be a few things going out. Lewis Ferguson is always going to be one that we, we would speak about going out, but do you suspect there'll be any other major departures? Um. Matty Kennedy's still not left, does he? So I imagine, I imagine someone will take him on loan or something. He's been pretty much frozen out. Mm. Um, I, I do think, I think Ferguson will go. Um, now that we've got long staff in, it makes sense to. I, I don't know. I suppose it comes down to whether Ferguson's going to be happy staying. There's just no point keeping a player if he's yeah. down in tools essentially. <clears throat> um, so if, if there's multi-million pounds bids coming in you'd like to think we can you know try ramp the price up higher than the two million that was reportedly offered before um and you'll probably go i, I don't think we'll see any more come in i don't think um god knows what's up with devon i don't know <laughs> no idea um base is totally enough um mm. and then yeah we are sure you can't deny that that center half still but that's what i'm saying i suppose yeah, I think we might see maybe a few players going out on loan. Um, touched on it in the last episode, Michael Ruth. I maybe expect him to yeah. get some some game time elsewhere. There, I noticed before we recorded a few folk on Twitter mentioning Dylan McGeeck's name, whether or not he'll still be around uh, after the transfer yeah. window. I, I personally would like him to still be here. I think he offers something that that kind of is similar to, to Scott Brown in terms of that experience in the, in the middle of the park. And, and I think more so, I suppose his departure would be strange if Ferguson was to go as well yeah I was just about to say that I think that might depend on Ferguson coming or going I quite like McGeoch and I think he's got something to offer he's um, you know he, he was so good for Hibs at that, that spell of his career mm-hmm. um, if we get some sort of form like that back um, then he's, he's definitely worth something so yeah well, I suppose we'll wait and see um, if Ferguson comes or goes uh, I probably agree Ruth will go out but at the same time, that still leaves us quite short up front. If we get an injury to Ramirez, then we are struggling big time. So I hope he's, you know, a third guy. Yeah, I, I suppose. But then I thought, like, the way we've obviously gone with Watkins and Samuels, we're giving ourselves options, but are they options in the backup for Jet? But it'll be interesting to see kind of tactically how we approach certain games this season because, like you said, if when Ramirez isn't getting the service, he is a bit 
anonymous, but that's obviously through no fault of his own. Mm-hmm. He's doing other things, trying to create space for players. It's not like he's just a passenger uh, yeah. in the side, like I feel some other some other players may be. But yeah, obviously a disappointing way to end the, the first opening part of the season. But I suppose that you said we need to look on the positives and hopefully we can come back strong against Motherwell and I think it's right that hopefully some, some time on the training pitch will, will benefit us us for that game yeah hopefully 100% um, I don't think Motherwell up too much this season so yeah a good a good couple of weeks um, getting the players you know gelled and everyone knowing what they're doing and the tactics and the style of play and then beat Motherwell beat St Johnston beat this team I still can't remember Who's at the bottom of the league? Someone, someone rubbish, I know. Yeah. So and then we'll get nine points, nine points out of nine in uh, September. We fly in top of the league. I think we've got a tough October after that. Yeah, so we I do. Know. It's um, it's St. Mirren away on a Sunday cool. lunchtime. Diddy team, easy yeah. win. Um, and then yeah, we do have a tough October, so it will be important. We have a good, a good month. I hope yeah. there is away fans. Um, just going back to what you said, I think it's pretty poor not letting away fans. In. I know the the red zone, but Surely can accommodate. Like it's great that we gave away free tickets to the NHS, but can we not do that another time and let like away fans are so important? Like we we want to go to away games, so why were we not welcoming away fans yet? Yeah, looking at like the upper deck, there was a section next to they always put the red TV gantry in the the furthest the section in the top deck next to the away fans, what where they should be housed. But that section next to it, there was you know so sparse, there was hardly anybody in that. And I just thought Again, with no disrespect to Ross County, they'd have probably taken like maybe 300 fans mm-hmm. and you could easily have fitted them up there. They wouldn't have caused any sort of problem yeah, with anybody no. else around them. And like you said, it's the way it'll be reciprocated. You know, looking at um, away games or, you know, games being developed through the league so far this season, obviously no uh, away fans at Ibrox so far this season, no away fans at, at St Mirren so far this season. Although I think, you know, maybe not being that not being an option for Sunday at 12 o'clock would maybe be a blessing in disguise because I could think of better things to do. But, you know, certainly for, like I said, from an Aberdeen point of view, being denied the opportunity to go to these places, Celtic Park being another, it's just not, it's just not the same. Yeah, I agree. Um, it just, just feels like something clubs should get together and sort out. Um, I mean, maybe there is, you know, fundamental issues that, that prevent it but mm. after so long of saying like football is not the amount of fans blah 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 surely we can make a bit of an effort to get in yet like you say two to three hundred Ross County fans who are going to cause no problem mm. whatsoever in you know one, one area they don't need police really I mean a few stewards and not much else yeah. so yeah it's a bit disappointing but hopefully it gets to work soon yeah no definitely so certainly one to keep an eye on for well the game against St Johnson would be the, our next home game so see mm-hmm. what, what developed out of that because I think it will give us certainly an indication to, to what we can expect for that game against Celtic and I wonder how the club will deal with the pressure of uh, I mean again no disrespect to Ross County and, and St Johnson but a bigger club with a much bigger away following that's money for the club how yeah, the club true. will deal, deal with that because you know it's something um, Andy Skinner said you know it's not like Ross County are going to turn around and say well you're not getting in because the Ross County football is a business at the end of the day they need mm-hmm. that away fans the attendance yesterday was only 14 and a half thousand you know the club are going to be needing to make sure we're as, as full as possible for a game against Celtic can they go without um, away fans but an interesting point ahead of the Motherwell game I saw the Dundee team pre-match they actually came down the stand that the away fans were in so mm-hmm. past the Dundee fans because that's where they have to like come up and down yeah. to get to the changing facilities and I can just think in a couple of weeks if they put in a similar first half performance to, to what we did yesterday you can only imagine what the reaction would be at half time um, yeah. of some of our support was that as the players trundle past yeah not ideal it would be like a, what was that game in France the other day Nice and oh yeah Nice and Marseille, and Marseille. Yeah. Yeah. chucking the pies <laughs> No, definitely. Well, one to look forward to and one to keep an eye on. Certainly a talking point for, for future episodes. But Lewis, a pleasure to, to have you back on Red Tinted Glasses um, and joining me today. Um, Callum is just taking a few weeks off. He's got some issues that he's sorting himself 
out on. So, you know, it's very, uh, you know, brave of him to say, like, he doesn't want to affect the podcast whilst he sorts himself out, doesn't want to affect the, the quality of, of the show. He is still performing in the background, doing all the editing and, and cutting out any of the, the mistakes that may have, may have been made. But um, Lewis, thanks for being an, a much able de- deputy in his absence. No, thanks for having me again. It's been good fun. What comes, all right? Yep, perfect. And thanks everyone else for tuning in to the latest episode of Red in the Classes.